And our final speaker is Kavish Chetty, who is a graduate scholar of literature at the University of Cape Town, a former culture journalist at the Sunday Times, and he's currently working on a critical biography of Ai Kwe Amar. Okay, so a cult of idolatry has risen up around the figure of Walter Mignolo, regarded by many as the grandfather of decoloniality. His latest book, The Politics of Decolonial Investigations, is an exemplary study in the shortcomings of his own thinking. I here aim to rehearse some problems with his thought in the form of a handful of polemical rejoinders. Now, firstly, Mignolo has profited enormously of a uh, predatory equivocation of the word decoloniality, whereby entire intellectual and political histories associated with anti-colonialism and intellectual decolonization have become recoded as decoloniality. Now, there are a number of phenomena which result from this. The first is that it tends to eclipse the fact that much of uh, what appear at first glance to be innovations within Mignolo's discipline are in fact ideas with a much older pedigree that he has simply outfitted in a new language. And when I say new language, I am of course referring to the tortured neologisms and excruciating portmanteau words that litter his books such as pluriversality, shifting the geographies of reason, and so on and so forth. Now in this sense, one of Mignolo's principal accomplishments has been to contribute to the industrialization of the humanities. He has created a kind of mini industry. One is expected to be au fait with all of these exclusive arcane terms in order to participate in the conversation, and thus he pumps out these turgid 700 page volumes and all the uh, terms that come with it. Now, let's take one example. Let's take the word coloniality, which Mignolo announces on the first page of this book is the target of his analysis. Coloniality, of course, he is here referring to 500 years ago, the Latin American colonial encounter with the Europeans and how that acts as a blueprint for all subsequent colonizations. Now, this is, of course, an idea that many of us don't agree with. Uh, it's part of Mignolo's meta-narrative instinct. He wants to produce a grand unified theory of all oppression. And I'm afraid when one zooms into the details, often uh, his theory collapses. But of course, before the term coloniality, we did have Kwame Nkrumah's idea of neocolonialism. Neocolonialism neo was a protean enough signifier to capture not only the material rearrangements of the global order after the withdrawal of administrative colonialism, you know, the division of the world into creditor and debtor nations, or however you want to figure that, but it also was able to signify the shadow of Eurocentrism that had fallen over our culture in the aftermath of colonialism, the extent to which colonialism had infected the ways we think, uh, the ways we produce culture. It had come to, in some sense, invade our most intimate sensibilities. And of course, in the late 20th century, many artists, activists, and writers had profitably used the term neocolonialism with the objective of, we need to deprogram ourselves in some way from this toxic colonial inheritance. Another phenomenon which results from this enveloping of decoloniality into uh, decolonization or vice versa is that Mignolo is able to fortress himself from criticism by acting as though it is completely profane to uh, criticize him because you are at one and the same time criticizing that rich, illustrious heritage of anti-colonial thought associated with such figures as Amelcar Cabral, Franz Fanon, Steve Biko. So actually, Mignola creates this false impression that if you're criticizing him, you're criticizing these other guys, and so you must be some kind of inveterate pro-Western triumphalist. That's the only vantage point from which you can attack him. Of course, most troublingly, this allows Mignolo to smuggle the more aggressive aspects of his philosophy under the broader umbrella term of decolonization. And as we have seen, that includes, among other things, relativism, ethnocentrism, um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so my colleagues and I are here today to insist that there are alternative traditions of intellectual decolonization. Now, I shall have to say something here about Mignolo's vision of the West. Okay, uh, according to Mignolo, the West is the grand antagonist of the universe. It is the author of all contemporary misfortunes. His vision of the West borders on the conspiratorial. He offers an undifferentiated, monolithic account of the West that is insensible to its histories of internal dissent. Now, remarks such as these are emblematic of the way Mignola writes about the West. I quote, 
The pursuit of happiness is a Western obsession connected to the Western glorification of the individual and the Western glorification of material possessions. He gets away with making facile sweeping remarks such as there is a confusion in Western epistemology between what one sees and what there is. Now, this is a frightening diminishment of complexity. Uh, it is a straw man argument. It is a cartoon history of the West. According to Mignolo, the West is intrinsically materialistic, acquisitive, rapacious, racist, sexist, and homophobic. All the evils of the world radiate outward from Europe. Now, Mignolo sometimes appears to be marvelously erudite. He can discuss the journals of European explorers from 500 years ago. He can tell you how the rise of capitalism is deeply tied up with the invention of race. We can discuss theology and so on. But what is the point of all of this posture of erudition if he's just going to use it in service of this monochromatic narrative, which is the story of civilizational antagonism? And you know, here we can remember that Mignolo rose to prominence with his decoloniality school in the mid 90s, the same time in which the Cold War had entered, uh, had ended. Samuel Huntington was writing his Clash of Civilizations book. Francis Fukuyama was speculating as to the end of history. So it is within that ecosystem that the civilizational idiom uh, actually can quite uh, sensibly be situated. Ultimately, Mignolo gives us a Manichaean vision of the world. This is a struggle of good versus evil, which maps onto black versus white, which maps onto the West versus the rest. Now, uh, a word on uh, Mignolo's solution to all of this. Um, he proposes the idea of epistemic reconstitution. Now, the idea here goes that indigenous people have been wounded by colonialism. It's given them all these distortions about uh, their real culture and the value of their culture. And today's modern Western institutions are involved in an elaborate brainwashing campaign uh, whose objective is to acclimatize these people to their servitude within this new world system. Now, in broad brushstrokes, that's not, excuse me, that's not a position that I'm totally unsympathetic to, although I think he does go too far. Um, but... Mignolo goes even further when he insists that the only way to heal ourselves from this is to go back to the status quo ante and to rediscover those cultural traditions with which we will nourish ourselves and armor up for combat against the West. Mignolo often behaves as though pre-colonial cultural traditions are pristinely entombed in the past, simply waiting for retrieval by native epistemic archaeologists. Now, this is a view that is completely naive when compared to that advanced by the post-colonial theorists of the 1980s. They believed that modernity had placed a cataract over the past, that all attempts to access pre-colonial traditions were condemned to be refracted through the prism of the modern episteme. Okay, um, Mignolo uh, offers uh, kind of two operations in order to justify this, uh, the West versus the rest in this book. Uh, the first is a thoroughgoing exoticization of the pre-colonial other. All pre-colonial others are regarded kind of as noble savages. They are communal, tender-hearted. They live in rhythm, in rhythm with the seasons. They live in these ecologically sustainable ways. They are mutually interdependent on one another. They are, astonishingly, the total opposite of the vision of the West that he's just given us. And of course, the reason this keeps happening and the reason that whether he's trotting out ideas like Ubuntu, Pachamama, Sama Kause, they all read kind of like a tourist brochure. This is, of course, because Mignolo is simply ventriloquizing the other and making them speak his own decolonial idiom. The second operation is that Mignolo is comprehensively romanticizing the pre-colonial past. He gives us a version of the past that is prelapsarian. It is, in other words, before the fall from grace. Okay, and so uh, the, pre -colo the colonial encounter is figured here as kind of like a turbulent expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Okay, now, uh, Mignolo's got a problem here, which is that uh, what happens when dark-skinned people refuse to conform to his vision about their own epistemological traditions? They speak in a way that actually departs from his idea of how they should be speaking. Well, here, unfortunately, one of the most um, deleterious aspects of Mignolo's writing comes through. He wants to police indigenous people. He wants to tell them what to think. And ironically, in doing so, he commits epistemicide against anyone who refuses to uh, follow his own 
pathway of redemption. Uh, he thinks that all of these forms of thinking are secretly Western and self-destructive. We have been helplessly ensnared by the colonial matrix of power. Now, I'm going to cut it short there by just making some concluding remarks. Uh, one of my favorite literary critics, the Nigerian Marxist critic, Jayifo, over 20 years ago cautioned us that unless we were scrupulously vigilant about the appearance of these essentialist and ethnocentric discourses in our academic and cultural life, we would see, in his words, the resurgence of more primordial bases of allegiance and community. Of course, this would manifest in the form of ethno-nationalism, xenophobia, increasing suspicion of one another. Now, in my view, perversely, Mignolo has contributed to the reification of antagonistic racial relations. And beneath the utopian veneer of his scholarship lies a troubling, catastrophically regressive view of uh, human relationships. And so I must here agree with my colleagues that it is time that we went beyond decoloniality. Thank you. Okay, we've come to the end of the session, so we're going to have to wrap up. So thank you very much, all of you, for attending in person, and especially for the patience with technical difficulties uh, from those attending online. And all I can do is um, urge you or request that you please read the special issue articles. Um, if you can, there should, they're supposed to be free access to them, by the way, no, um, no paywall at the moment. And you will find that Kavish is as brilliant and to the point in print as he is in person. <laughs> So thank you very much, everybody.